Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and devoting a little bit of time to listening to me. Um, <laughs> I want to really cover a lot, uh, overview of biochar, what it is, how, applications, and how to make it yourself. Here's who I am. I've been a biochar consultant since 2012, doing a variety of things, technology assessment, market analysis, um, developing technology, doing a lot of workshops and training. And now, um, I'm now a manufacturer and um, seller of equipment. Um, before that, I worked for the International Biochar Initiative on communications and project development. And before that, I was a freelance journalist covering environment, energy, and climate change, which is how I found out about biochar um, and uh, you know wanted to get more involved in it. Before that, for many years, I worked as a forest protection advocate in Southwest Oregon. Uh, we had an organization called the Siskiyou Regional Education Project. I was the director of that. So I have a long history of um, working on public lands, wilderness, roadless areas, conservation, climate change, et cetera. But before that, I was an engineer. <laughs> and I got interested in engineering mainly because I was interested in renewable energy and sustainability. So I got that mechanical engineering degree, which has been Great to have a, a technical background like that for all the work that I do. Um, so here's what I'm going to cover three parts. We'll do it in three sessions with a little break in between. So first of all, what is biochar? How does it work? How does it do what it does? And then I'll talk about some a variety of different biochar applications, um, giving you some ideas about how you might find it useful in your work. And then finally, share you with you the techniques that I and others have developed for making biochar in place on your land. So what is biochar? Well, honestly, it's just charcoal, okay? <laughs> really, it's charcoal. The, the official definition is a solid material obtained from thermochemical conversion of biomass in an oxygen limited environment. And that's the definition of charcoal, but charcoal is a uh, can have a wide variety of properties. So. You know, I like to add to that, that it's suitable for the, the intended use. And in most cases, that's soil, that's the focus, that's my focus anyway. What does it do? Um, well, first of all, it adds a lot of car long lasting carbon to soil. Um, our soils are depleted of carbon. So that's one thing it does. Uh, it helps conserve water. It helps conserve nutrients. Uh, it can buffer soil pH. It promotes healthy soil microbial life and it increases plant growth. Um, this particular picture shows what it can do in a soil that's contaminated with heavy metals. So not every soil will show this dramatic improvement, but when you have a, a, some specific soil problems, biochar can have a dramatic impact. So how do we know that biochar is good for soil? Well, first of all, we know that um, it's some of the most fertile soils in, in the world. So the soils in Iowa, um, also, the soils we've been hearing about in Ukraine, where they're called a Chernozem, those soils have a really high proportion of natural biochar in their soils from uh, grass fires. So steppe land, prairie land, anywhere where there's a frequent um, a grass fire um, regime, you end up with a lot of charcoal in the soil. And in fact, also um, some of this in, in um, the United States was helped along by specific Native American burning practices that helped increase that char in the soil. So the most fertile soils have this char. And then we have the other example of an indigenous technology in South America where uh, soils were created that were called terra preta or dark earth. And these were um, created by humans, very obviously so because here I am, I got to visit Brazil in 2010. And this is one of the pits where they're looking at these um, anthropogenic soils. And they're, they are full of little uh, pottery shards. These little um, holes here had pottery in them. So they're just chock full of pottery soils. And because of carbon dating, they can tell that the oldest layers of the soil are, are thousands of years old. So it's over thousands of years these soils were created. The montage here shows the difference between the native soil which is highly leached, you know, it's a rainforest, a lot of rain, um, very acidic, and the terra preta soils and the difference in the crops you can grow on them. This was a farm I visited actually just uh, upriver from Manaus, which is the largest city in the Amazon. 
and a, a fantastic, I, you know, just walking through this farm, you pick up these pottery shards everywhere. You know, there were more people living in the Amazon before Columbus than there are today. So these terra preta soils supported an agricultural civilization that was very populous and, you know, something that really, you know, Westerners didn't even know about till a couple of decades ago. It was just assumed that it was all, you know, hunter gatherers, but no, it was a, it was a thriving civilization there. So, you know, and the, the, the um, Amazonians were not the only ones to ever use charcoal in soil. Uh, the, you know, the kind of traditional agriculture in Asia and Europe used night soil and night soil uh, was often mixed with ashes from the, from the stove. And those ashes often had bits of char. So um, it was kind of the secret to most sustainable agricultural civilizations is that we use the human manure and we often used it with ash and charcoal. Um, one exception being Egypt and the Nile River, which had the Nile floods, which renewed the soil every year. But without that, you really need to return those nutrients to the land or you don't have sustainable agriculture. So what is it that biochar does for soil? How does it work in soil? The key to understanding this, uh, first of all, would be scale. So I like to kind of separate into these different scales, the macro scale, which is our human scale, the micro scale, which is, um, you know, bacteria um, to the something that you can even see with the human eye, like a hair, and then the nano scale, which you really need a very powerful microscope to see. So that's the molecular level. Um, and so the biochar has um, impacts on all of these scales. So to understand how biochar works, let's look at how it is made. So we start with wood, which has a certain structure, a cellular structure at the micro scale. So, you know, you can see it somewhat with the naked eye, but you know, you need a, a hand lens or a microscope to really see those cells. And then um, you add heat to that wood. And what happens is that the structure is retained, but it shrinks because it's now you've, you've heated it up and you've just got carbon remaining. Now at the molecular or nano scale, some different things happen that are really interesting. So if you look at lignin, the lignin molecule has a lot of these um, six-sided hexagonal carbon rings. That's the molecule form of carbon that carbon likes to be in these six-sided rings, but it has all these other things attached to them. So hydrogen, oxygen, you know, that's, um, these are hydrocarbons or carbohydrates. And so it has many of these rings already, but it has all this other stuff attached. When you add heat, the oxygen and the hydrogen go away as a gas and the remaining carbon rings like to link up or fuse. So we call those the fused carbon rings. So they fuse and condense and that's why the biomass shrinks and turns black. Those fused carbon rings have really interesting pro properties. So they're very strong. And so microbes can't really eat them. So unlike you know, a wood chip that's not charred, you, you put that on the ground and within a few years, it's gonna be broken down. And all the carbon that was in it goes back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide as microbes eat it. Um, but with the biochar, you, when you make it from the biomass, you lose about half the carbon initially, but as time goes on, it just stays and stays and stays. Whereas the, the wood chip, uh, de de degrades and you know within 10, 20 years, it's all back in the atmosphere, the biochar stays. So that's why it ba it basically it's a climate solution. We're sequestering carbon when we make biochar from biomass. So, you know, that fused carbon ring also has a, another really interesting property. It, besides being stable, it's electrically active. So, you know, you've got the six carbon atoms with their electrons in orbitals. And those electrons are free to move around the ring. So it makes biochar electrically conductive and allows it to have also electrostatic attraction. So what we have with biochar is we have at the nano scale, these carbon atoms linked up. At the micro scale, you could see these, these uh, pores and from the plant structure. And then inside those, you've got surface area. That's where those, um, carbon rings are and they're elect 
they have electrostatic properties so they can hold on to things. So here we are, we're inside a pore and here's the surface area and there's all these microbes living on the surface. So microbes like to attach to something, that's why they form biofilms. And here they are in the, on these surface areas in the charcoal and some people like to say it's like luxury condos for microbes. So they have electric, they have water and food. And what's really interesting is you see this variety. So it, the, the, it's a lot of diversity, microbial diversity. And we all know that diversity is, um, makes for healthy ecosystems. So, um, and what they're doing is they're swapping electrons. So that's why they love it so much. One of the reasons is because when one microbe needs to get rid of an electron as part of their metabolism, another micro microbe might need it. And those electrons are available on the surface. So that's pretty cool. So now kind of zooming out to more of the micro scale, if you look at the, the pores here, this is how bi biochar works almost like a sponge. All those little pores hold, can hold water. So my biochar can hold water in the soil. And here's an example in Iowa. I already told you that it's got a lot of biochar in the soil already in Iowa. And during 2012, when I was visiting, it was a pretty bad drought year. And, but the Iowa corn was really doing better than most other places. Um, but they had some test plots where they had added even more biochar and it had even better water retention and growth. So it's, it's a linear um, relationship. The more biochar, the more water it holds in general. There's, um, of course, uh, subtle, subtle things to think about regarding that. So, so that's the water. Now, how about the food? How is uh, the biochar holding on to nutrients? Well, it, it's amazingly um, competent at holding on to a variety of nutrients. So cations, like our ammonium, calcium, and magnesium, but also anions. So these are the positive charges and negative charges, phosphate, nitrate, and sulfate and organic compounds um, and minerals. So biochar can hold all of these things. And here's some of the mechanisms by how it does it. Electrostatic tr um, attraction, hydrogen bonding, certainly not gonna go into all that because I don't really understand it very well myself. But just so you know, there's a lot of complex chemistry and um, different kinds of bonds that allow biochar to hold onto these nutrients. But here's where you can see it um, actually in a, um, a study that composted biochar with other material. That's the best way to get this biochar charged up with nutrients because when you first make it, it's just carbon and it's sterile because it's been made in, in a heat process. So you need to add the nutrients to it. And when you compost biochar with other organic materials, it gets this organic coating on it. A lot of it is micro poop and um, all kinds of other chemi chemicals. And it's really good stuff for soil. So you can see this yourself by doing some really simple experiments. So here's what we did. This was part of our conservation innovation grant, same program that's funding what you're doing. Um, NRCS funded this in uh, 2016 in Oregon. And we're making a pile here with goat manure and biochar that we made ourselves. And um, it got very hot very quickly. Biochar seems to really improve the composting process in a lot of ways. Um, and then see the chunks of biochar. After this, this compost was done, I took just, I picked just the chunks out of the compost. None of the compost, just the chunks of biochar. And I ground them up and I did a little pot trial. And we developed the method for this, which is in our materials that um, we can share with you. And so we tested them in soil mixes. You know, I just mixed about a teaspoon of this material in uh, plain peats, in a small uh, pot of plain peats potting soil, put cucumber seeds in it. And you grow it for two weeks and you test a few things, the germination rate, the amount of secondary leaves, so the, how, how much growth stimulation, and then the total biomass. So the composted char, um, it had way better germination, more, a lot more um, secondary leaves. So it was stimulating the growth and quite a bit more biomass than the control and even better than worm castings. So those are the, that's that organic coating um, at work. And you can see this for yourself. 
So the bottom line here is that when you're looking at soil, soil health and what biochar can do for it is it provides all these nutrients, holds them in place where plant roots can get them and ultimately helps form soil aggregates. So, you know, NRS, NRCS will tell you that aggregate formation is really the, um, the key to soil health. And so we put biochar in our soil, we stimulate that formation of, of soil aggregates. And so in kind of in conclusion, you know, put it in there and everything else will kind of form around it. Microbes like the biochar, biochar is stable and won't degrade over time. When I first heard about biochar, my, my thought was, wow, it's like permanent compost because I mean, I've been a gardener for many years and um, always, you know, trying to get more and more organic matter and compost in my soil. And it just, you know, your garden beds shrink every year. Your soil shrinks because the carbon is, um, is degraded and used up, but now my garden beds don't shrink anymore. You know, my, I'm building soil. It makes it much more easy to build soil. So there you go. Um, that is the basics about bio, what is biochar and how it works. And we'll take a, a break for questions right now before we move on to applications. And you can feel free to unmute yourselves um, or just type in the chat, whatever, whatever makes you happy. Somebody has asked, do we know why biochar has, why Iowa has so much natural biochar? Yes, it's because of the, um, the, you know, think of the prairie fires, you know, those prairie grasses, those are, some of those grasses were over your head. They were so big and tall. And, um, you know, every five or 10 years, there'd be a fire and those, that, those kind of fires are like really quick and hot. They just blow through quickly. They burn off the top part of the grasses and the heat will penetrate down into, you know, at the root right above the soil where the roots are very thick in a bunch. Um, there's not a lot of oxygen down there. And what happens is the heat would, would radiate down as the top is flaming. And it's very much like we make biochar and you'll see in a, at the end, when I talk about how to make biochar, we use that radiant heat, heats biomass and, and chars it without burning it to ash. So that's pretty much what happens in the prairie fires. And similar thing happens in forested areas too. Forested, forest soils also have a lot of char. Would biochar with it, work with the alkaline soil? Does biochar have a high pH? That's an excellent question. And something that you really need to think about probably in New Mexico, assuming you have fairly alkaline soils. So there are a lot of different ways of um, um, neutralizing the pH of biochar. It is usually fairly alkaline. And that's because of the ash. So everybody knows wood ash is alkaline and it can be very alkaline. So when we make our biochar, we want to minimize the amount of ash, but we're still going to end up with a material that's pH 8.5 or 9, um, which is, is high, when, especially when your soil's already um, alkaline. So the easy way to, do, to change that is to compost it, because when microorganisms live in it and you add nutrients, um, they deposit organic acids. And so composting biochar generally uh, reduces the pH to something closer to neutral. You can also add, um, I really like to use a lot of lactobacillus silage, mixing it with silage or silage inoculant or EM1, Okashi, if people know about that. I have a lot of recipes in my biochar cookbook, which we should figure out a way, CJ, to share that with everybody. Um, it's an ebook, so we'll get that to you. I have a lot of recipes that, that describe how to inoculate biochar and bring the pH down to something more neutral. Would it be compatible with worm compost? No, worms love it. Worms really love it. Um, I use it all the time. I have tons of, of worms in my compost. I've used it actually in my worm bin. The key with biochar really is um, the amount, you know, the application rate. So, you know, don't add too much and make sure that it's nice and wet. The main reason why worms are might not like biochar is if it's dry because it 
would be scratchy <laughs> and they don't want it to be scratched. So make sure it's nice and moist and, um, you know, mixed with some other organic material, the worms will be fine. Um, the forest fire question, I'm going to get to that later. So let me wait, hold off on that. Okay. So anybody else? Shall I move on, TJ? I think so, Kelpie. Would, would now be a good time to ask our management question? Yeah. Okay. I've got a little, a little, we're getting a little interactive here. There's a poll. Okay, let's, um, is, if you haven't had something pop up on your screen that's asking you a question, please let me know. Oh, I'm getting answers, Never mind. <laughs> But if it hasn't happened, then let me know. And uh, I actually don't know what I'll do because I'm not entirely sure how to troubleshoot this. But <laughs> um, oh, and and if you're answering other, would you please um, would you please uh, add something into the chat about um, what you're doing? Um, and just for clarity, I think. Um, we, I, I think of biochar um, on uh, like so far we've, Kelby's been talking a lot about soil health, but there's also an aspect of fire risk mitigation. Um, if folks are removing um, problem species and, um, and leaving wood material behind, whether scattered or in piles, um, there's a higher fire risk um, so, so we're just thinking about and trying to collect more information about what, um, what folks are doing to manage, um, invasive or encroaching species so that they can, um, so that we can get an idea of, of, um, what you're dealing with. Um, so I think since I haven't gotten a new, a new anything, um, will share this with everyone. I think the only person who is who is easy to ask is Kelpie. Can you see? Yeah. yeah. Well, amazing. Great. Um, who is our other? Or I mean you don't have to tell us who you are, but um what what else um what else are you doing to manage invasive or encroaching species, if you would like to share. Oops. Okay, we'll just hand it back to Kelpie. I hear somebody, but not very, it's not very loud. Do you want me to, to uh, get back to the presentation now, CJ? Go for it, Kelpie, yeah. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to talk about a variety of applications that um, might be relevant to, to y'all in the Southwest. So biochar, you know, it's, it's carbon. It has a lot of uses that it could be um, mater just materials for industry um, that are very intriguing to look at, but I'm not going to look at those. <laughs> We're going to talk about, you know, the things on this end, livestock feed filtration, soil remediation and agriculture. Um, okay, so, but kind of more on the, towards the industrial end of things, you know, there's this stuff called activated carbon. You've probably heard of it. It's used uh, mainly in filtration and it's very good at, at uh, cleaning things up and absorbing things. And it's, uh, you know, the, works on this principal surface area and activated in this case means they'll take something like um, coconut hull or, or hardwood charcoal and they'll blow it out with steam to increase the surface area even more and it makes it it's kind of expensive it takes a lot of energy to do that and but it makes it very effective at absorbing things but we find that we can make biotour that has surface area of 300 square meters per gram which try to wrap your head around that a little bit, but it's like you have a teaspoon of powdered charcoal 
all the little pores inside there all have surface area and it can be as much as a football field worth of surface area in a teaspoon of charcoal. So it's hard to, to conceptualize, but it's true. Now activated carbon has 500 to 1000 square meters per gram. So 300 is pretty close to that. It's a lot of surface area. And um, so biochar can do a lot of the things that, that activated charcoal can do, um, specifically holding on to toxic organic compounds. So you can clean up soil that might be contaminated with toxics and it can also hold heavy metals. So, you know, um, so for instance, it's being used, it's in these, um, these totes here, a zinc roof has a lot of zinc and copper that comes off and uh, it goes into the Puget Sound where it's killing fish. So if they run it through this filter first, um, they, can, they can keep the water cleaner for, for life. And um, so biochar, it's less expensive than activated carbon. You might use twice as much to get the same job done, but it costs four times less. So you're ahead. So that's one kind of application. Here's another one that's really effective, which is all the mine sites, you know, all the places where the, the soil was just totally destroyed, washed away, whatever. And like this particular slope here was a hundred year old mining site, mine tailings that never revegetated. They sprayed this mix of compost and biochar on it and it all of a sudden it could grow things again. So with the number of abandoned mines we have in the West, um, you know, there's a big potential for biochar to restore those soils. There's another example in the filtration end of things. This is an agriculture where, you know, in the Midwest, we have really great agriculture, but that's at the, the cost of a lot of pollution because nitrogen and phosphorus are often over applied. They leach out in the rains, they end up in the Mississippi River, ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, creates a dead zone. So this bioreactor with wood chips and uh, biochar is very effective at these field drains, um, filtering that water. And uh, retaining the nutrients. So you can actually also use biochar to make a fertilizer that won't leach out in the first place. Um, this is just one example from a, a paper where they looked at combining urea with biochar and it slowed the, the leaching and uh, improved the, uh, um, the nutrient use efficiency of the plant. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And here's another way to do it. This is a farmer in Missouri who's been experimenting with biochar. And, you know, to just put biochar down on the whole field could be kind of expensive um, because, you know, biochar is not completely free to make. It does cost something to make it and move it around. Um, so what he did is he's doing a, a limited till. And so he would concentrate the biochar in a band below the seed and add it in with um, the other nutrients. So he's not manufacturing a biochar um, slow release fertilizer, but he's just adding the things at the same time in a really precise application. So he's got his liquid ingredients and his dry ingredients, including the biochar. He you know, invented this, uh, this um, equipment himself and he's doing really, really well with it. But we could also look at some of the nutrients that we're just wasting. So we all know we have a huge problem with food waste. We don't do a great job with manure management, um, waste treatment plants, um, you know, are very, you know, they're creating greenhouse gas emissions and um, losing nutrients that could be reapplied to fields and our composting systems aren't the best. And then we've got all this biomass that's just going up in smoke. So there's a lot of opportunities here to capture nutrients that are being wasted. And biochar really can actually be the missing ingredient that lets that happen. Here's an example of a compost yard in Kansas City. Kansas, and they, they take all the food waste and yard waste in Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas. And um, they um, started using biochar a few years ago. So they have this huge yard with lots of windrows 
and they're adding a certain amount of biochar to it. And one of the most interesting things is that they don't have to turn it. They only turn it once because the biochar holds air so it doesn't get anaerobic. And the biochar is also going to be preventing emissions of um, methane and um, carbon dioxide. And it finishes in half the time. So I found this in my garden that biochar is a real game changer when it comes to compost. So this is especially important too in a in a big city, they've got a nice yard, but they are processing a lot of material and they're limited by the amount of space they have near a big city. So this lets them process twice as much material in their yard because they can do it in half the time. Um, here's another example from our conservation innovation grant. So this was a grass fed beef operation. And um, this, they have the, they're, it's very wet in Oregon in the winter usually. And so they, they keep the cows off their pasture and feed them um, during the wettest part of the winter in a feed barn. And you get this yard. And so we did some experiments with biochar. You can see some of the biochar here where they're trampling it in. And so um, here they are, here they are with the biochar in the barn. And so one year, we did this for a couple of years. So the first year we, we um, this is nitrate, nitrate and, and ammonium. And without, so what they do then is they scrape all the manure out and pile it. And they don't really compost, they just pile it and then it gets spread on the field. But the first year, you know, it, we had um, with no biochar, this much nitrate measured in the material. The second year we uh, didn't get the, biochar in the barn, we mixed it after it was cleaned out. And that helped retain about double the amount of nitrate. The third year we got the biochar in the barn before the cattle were, went in there, they pooped on it and you know all winter and mixed it with their hooves and look how much more, 10 times more nitrate retained. That nitrogen was gonna go up into the atmosphere as ammonia, but we saved it so it could go on the farmer's fields. But what if we have acted up even further instead of just adding the biochar in the barn, we actually fed it to the animals. So, um, you know, or we could do both, but um, biochar as animal feed is a really intriguing uh, approach. And so there've been a, quite a few studies. Um, it's still sort of, um, they're still learning about it and it hasn't really been, totally approved uh, by the FDA, uh, but it has a lot of potential and um, for improving animal health and reducing methane emissions, especially is a big interest. And, um, you know, also increasing the value of the, what comes out the other end. And the, here's another case where biochar is, it's new to us, but it's not new to our ancestors. So um, some of us started looking at old agricultural journals that you can find on Google Books online. And there's a lot of them. And I started looking through those and just typing in charcoal as a search term, which biochar, they didn't know biochar, but you type in charcoal, you'll find lots of information about how charcoal was used by farmers um, in the 1800s when they were first starting to write about this stuff and specifically as an animal feed. So especially when, um, you know, in this case, this was uh, for the, the county fair and they would do a, um, you know, a rate the milk fat, the, the quality of the milk and the dairy products. So when they were preparing for that, they would always, this was their feed uh, ration mix for the, those contests. So they would always add charcoal, especially when they knew their, their products were gonna be um, judged in a competition. So let me just talk a little bit about biochar and rangeland. I don't know a lot about it myself. And I did a little bit of reading in preparation for this to see what, you know, um, what's being recommended currently for dealing with invasive uh, species, shrubs in rangeland that are encroaching on, on forage. And so I could see that herbicide was um, probably the, you know, uh, you know, definitely something that's used a lot. And that 
the idea was to kill the shrubs and the you know and that works but then then what happens you know what stops them from coming back and the conclusion seemed to be that yes you can kill shrubs with herbicides but it's not a permanent solution and that in, at the end of the day you need better grazing management for one thing so and then you know cj said a lot of times the shrubs are just killed and just left there because burning is a little bit iffy um, however, if you do burn, at least you have the ash, so that's some nutrient cycling. So instead of just um, letting the dead shrubs sit there, um, the ash does provide some nutrients. However, burn scars can promote weeds, so there's a downside there. Um, and so I found a couple of studies that looked at biochar application of rangeland, so I'll, I'll, I'll go over those. But the summary is that a simple application of biochar to rangeland didn't seem to provide any benefits. But um, applying biochar and then combining it with intensive rotational grazing uh, did increase the forage. So here are these studies. This first one was done in eastern Oregon, so colder environment than where you are. Um, so they were looking at biochar and they were made the biochar from the juniper, um, actually in one of my kilns. Um, and then they, um, they thought maybe the biochar would uh, help, you know, establish um, seedlings because it would maybe warm the soil surface by darkening it or they, it would improve water retention. And so they did that and they followed it for a couple of years and compared it with plots that where it was burned in, the, in place and it wasn't biochar, it was just ash, and then control plots that were not, had no biochar at all. And what they found was the biochar didn't improve the seedling establishment compared to the control. And actually the burn scars had better seedling establishment. And this is most likely because biochar tends to, when you first, it's first applied, it absorbs the nitrogen that's there. So in a very, low nitrogen soil, um, it could have re even reduced the nitrogen. So um, that's always something you need to consider with biochar, you need to add it with nitrogen. And then the other thing was that it didn't seem to help with the water uh, retention because the soils never got saturated, it was that dry. So it, it, they learned some things, but they didn't, from what they did, they didn't see benefits from biochar. Now in this other rangeland study, this was in Montana. Um, again, you know, a dry area, but not particularly, you know, totally like what you're dealing with, but still um, what they found was they included, they, um, they included grazing as part of it. So this is actually a more realistic real world kind of study. And uh, so they applied biochar and they brought in the, the cattle and they had a control that was the cattle without the biochar. And without the biochar, they found that the soil was compacted a lot more and that um, it, you know, the forage didn't do as well. With the biochar and the cattle grazing, they found um, improved phosphorus in the soil and they found um, better um, forage growth with the biochar. So it's, uh, I, my conclusion would be that if you were to use, uh, take your um, material that you're removing and make biochar in place and then bring cattle on and graze afterwards, it, it, could, uh, it could definitely be successful. So just some, something to think about as you look at your own situation and have ideas about what might be helpful. Now I'll talk about trees and forestry. And um, so, you know, uh, biochar and, and putting biochar on the root zone of trees uh, and putting it around the drip line of established trees, all of these things are, are very beneficial. And there are a lot of studies and projects that have demonstrated this. Um, the Morton Arboretum has done a lot of work here. Uh, you see increased root growth and you see resistance to plant disease. You see better um, mycorrhizal relationships with roots. Biochar really promotes mycorrhizae. 
And so we all, you know, this is going to benefit trees. Here's an example from Northern California, a tree nursery without, with biochar, without, with biochar. You really see it in the roots. And then that translates, of course, into the above ground. For nurseries, if you're, if you're purchasing peat, you're purchasing perlite, biochar can be a, a, at least a partial substitute for both of those. So, and these are mined ingredients. So it's more sustainable as a growing medium. There's been a lot of work on just gen generally um, biochar and growing media. Well, let's talk about forests and fire because this is my main area of concern. Um, this fire happened in 2020, about 10 miles from my house. The spot is, we were evacuated for a couple of weeks. It was frightening, very disturbing. You know, this watershed was completely green and lush for most of the 30 years plus years I've lived here. And now it looks like this. Um, really concerning. And I know you have similar situations in the mountains in New Mexico. So this kind of high severity fire is really unnatural. And so what can we do? Can biochar have any role to play? Yes, there's some char here, <laughs> but there's no soil, you know? So yeah, char, biochar helps trees grow, but how can, could biochar do anything to protect trees from burning up like this in these high severity fires. Um, you know, the problem here, it's climate change and drought, but it's also fire suppression. You know, we have suppressed a naturally, um, a natural fire regime that would put low intensity, low to medium or mixed, you know, severity fires across the landscape in my region, probably every 10 to 15 years. I don't know what it is in New Mexico, but most of the forests of the West are fire adapted forests. They're supposed to have regular fire. And so, um, you know, that's why we have a lot of biochar in the soils naturally. It's always gonna be mixed. Uh, here's some studies that show that um, in, the, in, the, in the, you know, when you dig down into a, the forest soils, the more the older horizons that are deeper down have a lot more char than the more recent horizons because we've suppressed suppressed fire and that the the sites that have multiple regular fire have a lot more char because the fire is less intense so there's more char that's made less of it is less of the material is burnt all the way to ash and of course you know it's very much correlated to fire return interval, the vegetation type, you know, it's, it's of course, you know, it depends on the topography, the weather, the climate and all these things. But um, char is a natural part of forest soils and we need to put it back. So what are we doing? There's two things, there's pre-fire vegetation management, of course, you know, all these fuels reductions projects that are taking place across the landscape very labor intensive, very expensive, you know, but it has to be done, especially, you know, in the WUI, in the wildland urban interface, um, strategic fire breaks, you know, the, more and more of this work is going to be taking place. And so um, while we're doing that, could we use that material instead of just burning it to dispose of it and sending all the particulates and carbon into the atmosphere? Um, or chipping it and then driving it, you know, how many miles, um, could we make it into biochar and use it to replace the char that's missing in our forest soils? Then we also have the post-fire situation where, <laughs> you know, I, I told my mother I was going down to paradise to do workshops and she said, well, what do you have to burn there? The whole place burned, there's nothing left. And I was like, well, mom, you know, actually, well, the fires, even the high intensity fires don't kill everything and they certainly don't burn everything to ash. There's just a lot of dead trees that, that need to be dealt with. So, cause it continues to be a fire hazard. So how can we leverage these activities that we really have to do for our protection um, to make char and um, improve forest soils? So there's really two options here um, to do this. So we can do our thinning work and 
um, then use prescribed fire, which is a, really the good thing to do. And in fact, this is something, you know, that I, I don't have a slide about this, but the indigenous uh, practices, the traditional ecological knowledge of, in, in my area here where the regular fires were lit by the people to um, decrease fire danger probably, and also to promote the growth of certain plants that they use for basketry materials and food plants. Those really created our landscapes. And so we need to return to those. Um, but we could also do this forest thinning and kind of jumpstart that process by making biochar in the woods. And this picture here is from a group of veterans that are, that are trying to take this work on right now. So, okay, so does biochar that's used for remediation need to be disposed of elsewhere or does it bind up and deactivate heavy metals and contaminants permanently somehow? Well, the answer is that depends <laughs> on what it is. So um, I, and I'm not an expert in this, but I do believe that some heavy metals can be pretty much permanently bound up in the biochar and won't be taken up by plants. Um, it really would depend on the degree of the contamination. Um, but, it, you know, it's interesting, what, you know, think about putting biochar in the ground and it's binding to metals and so forth in the ground. And it's almost, um, if you look at coal, one of the problems with burning coal is that it releases a lot of, of heavy metals like mercury. And um, so what we're basically doing when we're making biochar is we're making coal. You know, over time, it's going to become something, it could become something like coal. And, uh, and that's okay, you know, because when it's in the ground, it's fine. It's just when you release it, that's a problem. So I think for some heavy metals, I think that is the case that it can bind them and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, organic contaminants are going to be all be different. So in some cases, it might help them to degrade to more harmless things. Um, but you'd have to, to really look at the specific contaminant. Okay, but humanor, yes, one of my favorite topics. I, um, so I do a lot of composting of humanor with biochar. And one of my favorite things to do is to make biochar urinals because urine is usually sterile. And um, so you can use it right away in, in soil. So I collect my urine and my friend's urine and uh, I will usually actually put it in the compost pile first and compost it, but it's a great way to capture nutrients, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus that then you don't have to pay for and uh, enrich your compost. Very easy to do. The poo, um, I do that as well. And that's a longer process, but I do it differently than other humanure composting. I do, I follow a method that's called terra preta sanitation that was developed in Germany at the University of Hamburg. And um, this is actually a, a, a anaerobic fermentation. So I have five gallon buckets with biochar in the bottom um, and I use Bokashi, so that's a, a lactobacillus. And that's all in my biochar cookbook, which CJ, we need to get that to everybody because it has the recipes for that. So yeah, and whatever kind of composting, if you're using aerobic human or composting, definitely add biochar to it. It will help a lot. And it will be very similar to the results uh, in the barn. Um, so interaction between biochar and, and PFAS. There's been some recent work on that. I am not, I haven't read those papers yet. So I, I just can't really talk about it, but I know that there's a lot of potential there for biochar to um, remediate, remediate those. Um, yep. Oh, there's the, oops, sorry. Shouldn't have looked at that. That is not supposed to be there. There's the book. Thank you. Huh? Oh, sorry. Apart, thank you. For book. Yeah, book. I, you yeah. know, it, I'm, I'm mad that I told those people to take it down. I don't, oh, well, anyway, go ahead and download that if you want. Um, all right. So that's all the questions. So now let me talk about how you can make biochar yourself on your own land. And the tech, there's the basic technique is flame carbonization is the term for it. And there's two methods. You can do it either 
in an open burn pile or in a kiln or container. I'm gonna talk about all of that now. Um, so first though, I wanna talk about how not to make biochar. So most people who know a little bit about charcoal making or you know, don't even, might not know much, but they know that charcoal's made in a pit or in a container. And the traditional way of doing that is very polluting. And so, you know, dig a pit or, or have a container, load it full of wood, light one end of it, you know, and then it slowly smolders over days. It's a long process. And then the smoke is released. There's never any flame. It's just smoldering. And this is horribly polluting. And the resulting charcoal is not great for biochar because it was made at a low temperature. Um, there's still a lot of tarry and oily stuff in it, which is fine if for cooking fuel, but it's not what you wanna put in soil. So this is how not to make biochar. So what I'm gonna talk about the flame carbonization method is something most people have never heard of before, but once, you under, once it's explained, you'll get it pretty quickly. So, um, as I'm talking, think about the last time you made a bonfire and or used a fire pit. And remember that there's a stage of the fire where you have glowing coals, okay? So when you take a piece of biomass and you heat it, the first thing that happens is it's got water in it and the water is gonna leave. So here's a burn pile with, you know, when you first light it, that's a lot, mostly, a lot of that is steam, that's water leaving. Then as the water's gone, now the volatiles leave, and those are those hydrogen and oxygen containing compounds that were attached to the hexagonal carbon rings that I showed you early on. Those leave as um, a gas, and when that gas burns, it makes a flame. And then when that gas is all gone, now you have the, the glowing coal stage where you just have, um, you know, it just glows. It's like when you barbecue food with, with barbecue charcoal, you don't see flame. It just glows and it's very hot because it's, it's radiating heat. But what's happening is the carbon is burning to ash. And the ash is just the minerals that don't burn, you know, the calcium and iron and stuff like that. So what we do when we make, when we make biochar with flame carbonization is we go through all this process and we get to here and we cut it off and we save the char. So you can do that in a bonfire, in an open burn, if you hit it with water at the right moment. Another way to look at it is we have a, a stick. We're going to burn away the outer portion of the stick to provide the heat to char the inside. So that's why these methods work best on smaller material, not on big logs, because it's not efficient. You have to burn away so much of the material just to get to the middle to char it. So that's it. And um, it's pretty basic. So now I'll show you some specifics. So the first method we call conservation burn because we're conserving the carbon out of this. And this is just a standard old burn pile that, that we have from our fuel reduction efforts. And the first thing we do is light it on top. And, you know, because most people think, well, you need to light it underneath. Well, you can do that, but you're going to end up, it's going to end up being a lot slower. Um, so you know, people think you need a light on the bottom because heat rises. Well, it's actually not true. Hot air rises. But it, two things that happen. When you keep the flame on top, it burns the smoke so it's a lot cleaner. And the other thing that happens is that it, it actually burns down from the top because of radiation. So the radiant heat will light the other stuff on, on fire and it's actually a faster process. So we burn it down until we have the glowing coal, heap of glowing coal stage, and then we put it out with water and we end up with this on the ground, a little pile of char. Um, here, this is one we did uh, a year earlier. I came back after a year to see what it looked like and all these things are growing where that char is. And this is really important because the, the standard way of doing burn piles creates a burn pile scar. And that's because of the charring. So here again, you know, shows you the difference between having a flame on top and lighting it on the bottom because this gases are coming out and there's no flame there to burn them. 
So they condense and make smoke. That's all smoke is. Smoke is condensed ga wood gas. And this shows you what happens when um, you burn it all the way to ash. You burn the soil, you destroy the soil. And some of these burn pile scars take decades to come back. So here we are doing a, just a regular burn pile and then we're putting it out at the end of water. And that's always the challenge is getting the water when you're out on the landscape. Um, you know, it's, it's, we don't always have a, a fire truck there to give you water. So we, we tried this with backpack pumps and we were able to, to do a pretty good job. And here's the difference. So here's one, here's one that we put out with water and here's one that just burned to ash. And you can see there's, there are some chunks of char here, but most of the soil is completely destroyed. And here in this one that we put out with water, there's, there, it didn't destroy the soil, it didn't incinerate the soil. So there are still some um, um, unburned fir needles underneath that. And just another picture showing uh, coming back a year later and seeing what's growing in a, a burn pile where we quenched it with water. So we, lately we've been experimenting with different styles of piles. <laughs> and of course, this depends a lot on what you've, what your biomass is like, you know, it can be very different. Here we are in California and this is oak. And even though it's fairly dry, um, it takes a lot longer to burn than something like pine or cedar. So, uh, and there's different sizes. So here we have a rick, which is just crisscross like logs. Here's my ring of fire kiln. And here's another style that's more like a teepee where you've got small stuff in the middle and bigger things on the outside. And um, I liked this one actually. This one made a lot of char. The bigger logs on the outside, while they didn't burn all the way, they held the heat in and made a lot of char here. And then the bigger logs, you know, you don't always have to burn everything up. These things are not a fire danger. So if your objective is to remove fuels, um, we got rid of the fine fuels, that's a fire danger. The big stuff, it can sit there and be partially charred and not cause any problems. And so, you know, just another example, here's the, the black spots where we did conservation burns and put them out with water. And here's the, where they did it in the conventional way. These were done hours ago. People are still standing around waiting for this one to finish because it just, you know, it's gonna, it goes a lot quicker when you have the flame on top. And then we put it out with water. So in their, their conventional practice here, the crew that does this, they, they whoops, they, um, they're gonna have to, have to come back later that afternoon and make sure that it's out and they'll come back the next day. So it actually takes more time because they have to keep checking on it to make sure that it doesn't uh, start a fire. So the second method is what I call a flame cap kiln. And just, you know, really simply, it's a burn pile in a container is all it is. And it makes a lot more char though, because we have, we're able to control the air better. Um, it comes from these Japanese kilns, cone kilns. And um, I don't really know how long, you know, or how traditional of a process this was. But, uh, you know, they, they have this little diagram that shows how it works. And I just saw these pictures and I decided to try and make my own. Um, but basically, you've got the flame on top. It's radiating heat below, heating the biomass here. The gas is coming out, burning in a flame. And it's not burning to ash because no air can get in here. All the air is coming from the top. And it kind of, kind of, um, since the air comes from the top, it keeps the flame length low. And so you've got this kind of cap of flame hugging the biomass. And so we keep loading it though, and then we quench it with water at the end. This is the kiln that I designed that I'm selling now. And <coughs> it um, makes a couple of cubic yards in a, just a few hours. It's pretty efficient, the heat shield uh, helps a lot with the efficiency because it holds the heat in. And the other thing about it is it comes in modular panels. So you can um, put more than 
you can put several of them together and you can make up to, you can expand it up to five panels. I sell it in a basic three panel configuration, which makes a kiln that's about six feet in diameter. <coughs> Here's the five panel version. So the smaller ones we usually load are hand loaded and this one can be hand loaded as well, but if you've got a lot of material and some bigger material, you can uh, make a five panel version and load it with a machine. <coughs> Excuse me. So this diagram shows how it works. The heat shield not only holds the heat in, but it preheats air that goes into the kiln and that improves the efficiency. <coughs> and basically you just keep adding material and the char keeps building up in here until it's half to two thirds full. And then you just open it up and, and quench it with water. And this shows how uh, it, you know, cause the air is coming from the top, it actually kind of sucks in the smoke. So if you have a stick that's sticking up out of the kiln, the air flows are such that it will pull the, pull the smoke and the air back into the kiln. So it's very clean. Here, this just shows the steps. Um, we're loading it up with material, lighting it on the top, continue to feed it for a couple of hours. And then at the end, you just open it up because it's panels and you rake it out and spray it with water. So, you know, this is great, but this takes some work. <laughs> so now the question is, we've got a lot of biomass to deal with. How are we gonna get this done? Who's gonna do the work? Well, I've been promoting this idea for a while of a carbon conservation core. And it's based on the history in this country of a civilian conservation core. So, you know, back in the thirties, we had a major economic depression. We had a dust bowl. Um, we had a lot of unemployment and President Roosevelt created the Civilian Conservation Corps that did a lot of amazing work. If you've been to any national parks, you've probably seen some of the beautiful buildings and other structures that were built by the CCC. And um, they did a lot of tree planting and so forth. And I like the fact that he emphasized that this was complex work because working on the land is complex. You know, everybody wants to simplify the problems and just get it all done with machines, you know, that can <clears throat> supposedly do everything more efficiently. But this is intimate work. Whenever you're working on the land with biomass, it takes, it really takes, it's complex because it's, it's not all the same. It's not homogenous. We have diversity. And so it's really, it's complex work that needs a, a good, you know, a human touch. And so this car, the idea of a carbon conservation core is that, um, you know, it would be a service year for young people to improve forest health, protect communities from wildfire. And these, these people would know that they're sequestering carbon and they're building soil. <clears throat> so it gives people uh, a chance to be outdoors, do something that gives them physical fitness and a sense of purpose and a ho hope for the future. So. And, and this idea is catching on, you know, we have a lot of um, youth cores that are starting to do this work. So I'm gonna get, show you a few different examples of different projects. And um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, and these are just all the different kinds of people that can benefit from these job, uh, job opportunities of making biochar in the woods, or maybe in your case, making biochar on rangeland. Um, so you've got your contractors, wildland firefighters who, well, these days it seems like they're working year round, but uh, when they do have some off time, it's something they can do. Um, people who work with trees, uh, workforce development programs. So you have a lot of people who are trying to, are being helped to try to reenter the workforce because they have experienced <clears throat> trauma or addiction or other things that have, <clears throat> where they need help. And so this kind of work um, is really great work for anybody because 
being outdoors, being in the woods, working with with um, biomass and fire, it's it's healing work. You know, it's enjoyable work. You listen to the birds sing. You know, you're in the fresh air. It's really a a, a good, appropriate kind of work for a lot of people. Um, so, and then there are all the agencies, the land man management agencies, and the landowners who can all benefit from this type of work. <coughs> I've been working a lot with the U.S. Biochar Initiative and the U.S. Forest Service to provide some training and learning opportunities. We did a biochar in the woods training, full a full day webinar, um, and uh, those recordings are available now for you to look at. We also have a discussion forum and we um, so you know you can join that and you can submit your questions to other people and maybe get some answers and we also have a once a month zoom call the first Wednesday of the month at four o'clock Pacific uh, we get a bunch of practitioners together and we share information so <clears throat> you're welcome to join that too so here's a few of the the projects that um, I've been working on. This is something I've done now for two years in a row in my area here in Southern Oregon. It's, um, you know, trying to help young people figure out what they want to do, give them a taste of different careers. So we call this the forestry or natural resources on ramp camp. And it's a week of different activities. And one of the uh, couple of days are about biochar. Um, on this day, we use biochar that we made the year before in planting holes for willow. Um, and then we spent a day making biochar both in the kilns and in open burns that we call swapper burns. So that's a lot of fun. <clears throat> Here's the California Conservation Corps and the Redwood Forest Foundation. They've been doing this for a couple of years now where they're uh, making biochar in the Ring of Fire kiln. And here's some of their results. Um, and just, you know, the takeaway here was last year they sequestered 38 tons of carbon dioxide and um, made quite a bit of biochar. They're using it in planting, replanting redwoods. Here's another conservation co-op in Washington. This program is using, uh, working with college students who are learning resource management and they get, uh, they take a semester, they get college credit and they get a stipend and they're doing a lot of work along power lines on the, um, in the San Juan Islands. <clears throat> they're using the open burn, the conservation burn technique. And here's one of their burn pile uh, constructions that they're experimenting with. They're doing some work with tribes as well. Um, and this is a, a demonstration with the Potter Valley tribe. Um, and you know they've, they have a lot of land to manage. And so this is um, of interest to a number of tribes. <clears throat> um, this is a, a project in Montana that did a great job of just documenting what they did. So we need more of this kind of information. And I'm actually starting to work the Forest Service now. I think we're going to be able to, to do some real investigations and get some answers about costs. Because if we want to make sure the work gets done, we need to get funding. And if we want to get funding, we need to show how much it actually costs. So this was using the Ring of Fire kiln and they treated 21 acres. They did 85 batches, made about 1.3 cubic yards per batch. Total cost of the project, $2,000 an acre, which isn't that far out of line with um, um, you know, fuels reduction projects in general are usually about 1,000, 1,200 an acre. So it's a little more. <clears throat> Made 112 cubic yards of biochar. Um, broke that down by acre, 5.4 cubic yards per acre. And then by the cost, you know, per cubic yard of the biochar. And that's interesting, this figure. $376 per cubic yard. If I were to go out right now, and try to buy biochar by the cubic yard. And I can get the best price because I can get it over in Medford, which is 60 miles from here. <clears throat> and I can buy it in bulk um, 
from the biomass one power plant. It's probably the cheapest you can get it anywhere in the country, $125 a cubic yard, and then I'd have to transport it. So compare 125 to 376. Yes, it's more, but this was made in place. This included all the work of making it and of, you know, whereas the, when I buy it from Biomass One, it's a byproduct. So, and then it's in place, it's already applied, it's on the land. So that's kind of interesting. So what's next uh, for me is I'm continuing to sell these kilns. And um, I'm working, like I said, more and more with the, with the Forest Service and doing trainings and education. And what I think is most important if we want to see this work continue is to be able to quantify all the benefits to soils and forest health, to air quality, um, to climate, to rural development goals, to youth empowerment, so a lot of social benefits, as well as climate, ecological, and um, you know, productivity benefits for um, whether you're a farmer, a rancher, forester, and so forth. So I've been doing this biochar in the woods work specifically probably for about 10 years. And it's just a huge number of people who've been interested in it and have contributed to it. So I like to at least try to acknowledge some of them. And that is really all I have for you right now. And I can stick around and answer more questions. Thanks, Kelpie. Um, yeah, Rosa, do you want to do you want to take the stage for a moment, um, just so that we can get your information out there, and then we'll and then we'll do questions for a sec. Um, first, thank you very much, Kelpie, for all this information. That's amazing. I'm a student biochar, and I didn't know about all that. You know, I have like more, um, uh, I mean, less knowledge, of course. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for organizing the this webinar. Um, well, I am Rosa Soriano. I am from Dominican Republic and uh, currently master's student at New Mexico Highland University. In collaboration with the Dr. Tomo Falkowski and uh, Quivira Coalition, we are doing our research. Um, it's a socioeconomical research about biochar. We basically want to identify what are the main barriers um, that landowners have um, to adopt or to incorporate biochar into their land management. And for that, we are, um, we are uh, collecting data through surveys. So uh, CJ just shared a survey here. So um, I just want to invite you, if you could fill the survey to collaborate with this research, we will really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rosa. Yeah, this, we met um, earlier, so I'm happy to, and nice to talk to you again. Yes, I will contact you. <laughs> we have something okay. pending. <laughs> I would like to understand better about the biochar incentives. How does it work? Okay. Well, we we hope this uh, information, the findings that we get in the in the research, will help uh, to have a program more adapted to the reality of the land manager. Sometimes we are sharing something, but we, we are not sure that this is socially adaptive to the personal reality. So that's why we are like uh, collecting this information to understand better what is the position and what are the, the issues that they have. Yeah, so, I always try to work with people, you know, when I do workshops to like, what do you have? If you want to make biochar on your land, what do you have? Well, they can't afford to buy one of my kilns. That's fine. You know. Do you have a shovel? You can dig a very shallow pit, not a deep one, just a few inches, put your pile in there and light it on the top. And you can make a lot more biochar than if you didn't, you know, it's of knowledge. So you yeah. don't always have to have all the, all the fancy tools to do something. Yes, you know what I see in the part of the information that I have, I can see that more of the land owners, they say that they don't have enough knowledge about how to produce biochar. So it's not that they don't want to, they are not willing to, to take it or to incorporate it. It's that they don't know how to do it so they can take actions. So, yeah. And sometimes, you know, people just, they, farmers just don't have a lot of time, you know, so they, oh, biochar sounds great, but, you know, when am I, how am I going to fit in something extra? 
So if you can actually show them that it'll save them time somewhere else, like you have to do it, you have to take care of this burn pile. I've got to burn this stuff and get rid of it. I keep putting it off. I'm not looking forward to it because it's going to make a lot of smoke and it's, it's dangerous and I'm worried about it. So my pile keeps building up. Well, when, I, when people realize that if you light it on the top and put it out with water, it's cleaner, it's faster, and it's safer. And then, oh, this is not so bad. Now I know what I'm doing. I can do it. Yes, yes. So that demonstration kind of and workshops will be great, are great uh, ways to get in touch with them. Okay. All right. Well, so I tackle some of these questions. Um, there's Rosa's survey. Um, oh, stay, you know, Stacy, Jacqueline, you know, Stacy. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, I lived in Tacoma and like, I think the first time in 2001. So I lived with her and, and we've been friends for over 25 years, but she told me, I just visited in March and she showed me her kiln and she was like, you've got to start doing this. And she, because we're, we're sisters pretty much. Um, yeah. She was really excited. She was like, Jackie, you got to be peeing on some biochar. <laughs> like stop <laughs> peeing in clean water because what are we doing? You know, and I, 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 I love it. I love that innovation. So anyway, I just wanted that's to see great. You. I'll I'll tell Stacy I saw you. That's wonderful. Um, okay. Does the bird pile need to be wood only, or does it work to use bamboo as well? Sure, sure. We we'll use ba bamboo. I mean, the picture I showed of the Japanese kiln, they were using bamboo. <clears throat> I haven't ever used it myself. Um looks like it would work. I know some people have told me that bamboo, because it's in sections, it can pop and explode because there's these little sections when you heat them up. So be careful. Um, but, you know, I've used, you know, people also think maybe they can't use really fine brush, but that works great. Some of the best biochar I ever made was what we call tick brush here. It's just little fine brush. It's a CNO this very fine, you know, twigs. And I made a big pile of it and I put it on a piece of, of sheet metal. It was like some sheet metal roofing. So I, I put the burn pile on top of the sheet metal, lit it on top, it went really quick. The sheet metal reflected the heat back and it made so much biochar in just like half an hour. So, um, you know, if you just have some brush, put it on a piece of sheet metal and light it on the top and put it out with water. You can make a lot of char that way. We need- uh, Somebody um, says it sounds like gunshots. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> when the bamboo explodes. Okay. Just for, for down here, um, we actually got some pretty good char out of tumbleweed. So- Tumbleweed, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you could. Awesome. Yeah. And again, you know, I know everybody's scared about fire danger the the- <clears throat> One of the real advantages of the ring of fire kiln is it puts, it's like a windscreen. And, you know, when you just have an open burn pile, air comes in from the bottom and sweeps up to the top. That's the main difference. And that carries embers out. So when you have it in a container, all the air comes from the top. So it's just, it's burning and it's just sucking the air down in. And you don't, as long as the material's down in, you are not going to get embers coming out so it's inherently safer I know I've had the fire department local fire district come by inviting them out to see one of my burns and they were like this is so great because every year you know they respond to um, you know fires that are started by somebody doing a burn pile and what happens is you light that burn pile and you've got a whole mix of jumbled up stuff big logs little stuff it doesn't burn very well it sits there and smolders, you're tending it, you're in the smoke and it's nasty and you're like, oh, I don't like this. Oh, I need to go in the house and do something. This is taking too long. I'll just leave it for a while, check on it a bit. You go in the house, wind comes up, amber comes up, 
you start a fire and pretty soon you're calling 911. So <laughs> they're, you know, the fire, local fire district is very happy with the kill from the safety standpoint. All right, anything else? Just a quick question. Um, would you like to share the PDF of your presentation of today? Sure. Yeah, I'll send that to you. I would love to have it. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can have that. Yeah, and I'll send out um, some follow up stuff uh, afterwards, probably tomorrow, so that um, things like that and uh, some info, follow up info, wrapping things up. I'm also just going to do another plug for the evaluation because it really helps us assess how we're doing things. Um, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. This is really sweet. I love your questions. I've learned a lot and I've spent the last six months trying to learn a lot. So I, it's really fun to get, get even more just from the way, different way people think about things. Thank you, Kelpie. Thank you so much for, for bringing your knowledge and sharing what you know, and um, especially because we don't have a lot of information on how biochar will function in the New Mexico climate. Being able to apply what you know down here gives us some really good direction for uh, what questions to ask and how we, can, how we can learn new things. So I'm hugely appreciative of you and Rosa and everyone. And I'm supposed to say the NRCS again because they do wonderful things to help us do what we're doing. Um, my name's CJ again, I'll, I'll send you all an email. So if you have any questions or you want follow-ups, please do just email me directly. This is what I'm doing with my job right now. So like I, whatever, if you just wanna chat about biochar, bring it on. 